If you're interested in learning about cybersecurity, IT, security compliance, risk management framework, how to advertise yourself in IT and cybersecurity, check us out on ConvoCourses.com. We've got free courses. It's free to sign up, and I'm always releasing new stuff on there. All right, let's go. And I'm going to address a couple of more access controls real quick. We're going to go straight into these two right here. We're going to talk about AC5 separation of duties and AC6 uh, least privilege. These ones right here are um, probably the most overlooked security controls in the AC control family. And the reason I say that is because a lot of organizations I go to one of the main vulnerabilities that they have is they either give too many permissions to users that don't need it. They don't separate the different organizational duties. It's an easy one to do, especially if you're in a smaller organization where you only have like 10 users. A lot of times those 10 users will have 10 different hats. You know, What I mean is your security guy will do all the administrator work and they'll do all the system analyst work and then they'll also be making multi-million dollar choices for the whole organization that they don't that's not separation of duties and sometimes you don't really need you know multiple people because you have five computers right five assets and you don't really need a bunch of people to do all these different jobs these two right here are foundational like the organization really needs to have these but i notice a lot of people don't don't have them Let's kind of dive into what these actually mean. I realize I'm probably uh, talking about stuff you, you might not understand. So let's go back here. I'm on nvd.nist.gov once again, and I'm going to go to families just to show you how I got here. And I'm going to go to AC controls. I'm going to go to separation of duties. I just want to explain what separation of duties is, and then we'll go to AC6, least privilege. All right, here we are right here. All right, AC5, separation of duties. What is separation of duties? What do you do with the separation of duties? This is NIST 853. The organization, whatever organization you work for, this is what they will do. The organization separates organization-defined duties of individuals. What does this mean? Let me interpret it for you. All right. So it says the organization, if it's the Department of Health and Human Services, if it's the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Labor in, in Maine, whatever organization it is, the organization, let's say the Department of Health and Human Services, separates whatever duties that they define. So the organization has to actually define different duties and then they separate the duties. So the NIST is not telling you, yea, verily, all cybersecurity people can't do any kind of administrator work or administrator work can't do firewall work or a server guy can't also be a firewall guy. That's not what they're saying. They're saying that where it makes sense, you're going to separate duties apart. So if you have, and what you're trying to avoid is conflict of interest. That's what the reason why you're trying to do it, right? So, and there's certain places where it makes sense. If you're in a very small organization, you don't really have to necessarily, if you don't have the resources to do it or if there's no reason to do it, if you don't have a server that's controlling a thousand different systems or a hundred different systems, you probably don't really need separation to do these. You can have your ISO, your information system security guy, also do some, the firewall and also look at logs, you know, and there's no conflict of interest. But if you have a whole bunch of computer systems and you can't not even possibly track all the users on a day to day basis, and there's data, there's thousands of terabytes of data coming in and out of your network, yes, you probably want to think about separation of duties. You probably want to have a whole security unit that also watches the administrators and a separate administrator account that is controlled by a whole other office. All right, let's keep reading this and kind of get an idea of what's going on. You have to document the separation of duties of these individuals that the organization has deemed necessary to have, right? So if you have a firewall team and you have a server team, 
you have to document that these are the individuals who control this and these are the roles that control these items here. Define information system access authorizations to support separation of duties. So you're going to define what level of access these people have and then what systems that they have access to. So that's what, in a nutshell, that's what you're doing. That's what separation of duties is. And like I said, I do see this one violated quite a bit. It's a foundational best practice that you do in larger organizations, especially or medium size organizations. Let's get a little bit more supplemental guidance on this. Separation of duties addresses the potential for abuse of authorized privileges and helps to reduce the risk of malevolent activities without collusion. What does that mean? So think about it. You're in a large organization like Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin has a large contract with a health and human services. I don't have any pre I've never worked for Lockheed. I don't have any kind of special information on either one of these things I'm about to say. This is pure speculation on my part. So if I accidentally guess right, it was an accident, okay? <laughs> so anyway, Lockheed Martin, who I've never worked for, <laughs> has a large contract with Health and Human Services, right? They have a thousand computers and 10,000 users, right? So these 10,000 users, let's say, are managed on a server on several different Active Directory servers. Somebody, one of the administrators, is doing something they shouldn't do. They are making new users over and over again. Why do we have 10,000 users? Somebody is making new users. So in this case, you would want to have separation of duties so that this person who's abusing their power is monitored by a whole nother organization. This is just one example of separation of duties, by the way. You could have a security operations team and what their job is to do is to watch everything on the network. They're not only watching data going in and out of the network, but they're also watching users. Maybe they have a flag set up to whenever somebody creates a new user, they can see who created the user, what account made that user, when did they made that user, and then, and maybe they even set up something like a justification, like a why. So every time you make a new user account, you have to make a justification and go through the SOC team. So that is one way that you can make it so that these people aren't abusing their power. And that's what they're, they're saying here. Separation of duties addresses the potential for abuse of authorized privileges because somebody could give themselves more privilege or they can make 15 other accounts and then make all those accounts these secret backdoor user accounts that allow them in inside access. There's just so many different things you can do if you don't have separation of duties in a large environment. And that's really mainly what it's for. So you want to do it when it's when it makes sense to do it. 